Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Jess Forsberg, our Mercury Product Line Manager, will be presenting today, and the subject is thermo decomposition from mercury analyzers. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to submit those throughout. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Jeff. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining the presentation today. Our last pre presentation was a dive into software for the Hydra 2C. This one, we're going to look at method development, uh, setting of the parameters, um, some ASTM uh, compliance and US EPA compliance, and then some basic maintenance tips. First of all, so we've been in business for 25 plus years, um, and the Hydra 2C was introduced in 2007. Our customers include environmental through water and wastewater. So if you're in any of these groups here, you're in, in good company. So we uh, pretty much fit in any laboratory from mining, agriculture, energy, pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, and so forth. So the Hydra 2C thermal decomposition uh, mercury analyzer is direct determination of mercury at trace levels for solid and semi-solid samples. and um, low PPB micrograms per liter in aqueous samples, and determination of um, trace levels, PPB in petroleum, petroleum distillates. And one of the benefits is there's no time consuming or complex digestion steps. We don't use any wet chemistry for solids and semi-solids. The only chemistry or reagents that we may need to add if you're running aqueous samples and you're using a nickel boat and it's acidified in nitric acid for preservation. Uh, I like to use a 0.03% L-cysteine solution, which is a sulfur-based solution. It will secure the mercury in the boat. One of the reasons for this is that um, nickel uh, will react with uh, acid in the solution and will off-gas hydrogen. So that as the hydrogen off gases, the potential is there for mercury removal from the sample as well. And additionally, we eliminate um, toxic waste disposal because it's just basically ash you're disposing of out of the boats. Um, so it's um, matrix independent analysis. It's mass based and you can use one calibration. So a one size fits all approach because it's mass based. Um, and standard operating conditions can be used for most sample types. And you run multiple sample types automatically without operator intervention. Uh, fast turnaround time, about five minutes uh, from sample in to numbers out. So it's a really nice technique. So how does it work? So basically there's seven stages. We load, inject, dry combust, purify, remove the moisture, we collect the mercury, and then you elute the mercury and then you detect it. So dynamic range is probably, um, most used dynamic range is 0.05 to 1500 nanograms, and that's without sample pretreatment as I mentioned earlier. And so there's no stannous chloride, no sodium borohydride, and the light source is the standard uh, wavelength that most uh, manufacturers use for their mercury systems, 253.652 nanometers. We use two cells for uh, best fit, um, and it, it gives you a nice dynamic range from trace to uh, higher concentrations. Here's an example of a one PPB um, water solution um, shown at five mils. So it's a nice peak shape back down to baseline. So here's the sensitive cell and then this is the least sensitive cell. Um, the two cells are the most sensitive is a 10 inch cell and it's mirrored um, so that light travels through, hits the mirror through and back and then it goes through the short cell, the one inch cell into the detector. There's a ballast in between um, so that's where you get the peak separation. So it's good for soils, sludges, fly ash, 
fish, food, feeds, plants, ores, petroleum, crude, distillates. Basically, if you can get it in the boat, uh, we can analyze it for mercury content. Content And it's also a great tool for samples that have known chemical interferences um, when they're analyzed by a reduction or a digestion type system. The software, um, current software version is uh, Envoy 2.2, and we offer two paths for analytical success. Uh, one is our standard mode, uh, combustion AEA, and that's for aqueous liquids, inorganics, and non-volatile organics. Example would be petroleum samples with a high auto ignition temperature. And then our second mode of operation is CAA VHC, and that's for petroleum uh, distillates and volatile site type samples. So what is VHC? It simply stands for volatile hydrocarbons. Uh, the full acronym is CAA VHC. Um, we limit the weight um, of 80 milligrams uh, for trace de detection. And auto ignition events are uh, can potentially cause a system stress point. So what we do is we avoid those by precision temperature management at injection point where the boat goes into uh, the catalyst tube. Um, and also that'll um, retain sample integrity and then you have worry-free unattended batch analysis with this uh, VHC mode of the software. So now once you get up and running and you're ready to start analyzing samples, you really need to know a little bit about those samples. So I always say just Google the sample type and there's so much information out there. You can look for an approximate uh, assay of that sample. Um, so lower high concentrations may not fall into the analytical range and then you can increase or decrease sample weights. Um, large weights of uh, bad things, components that can shorten the catalyst life, such as uh, halogens and, and SOX and NOx and uh, organic sulfur, um, they can um, cause problems with the sy system. So if those are one of the components when you do an assay, you may want to start with lower weights and just see um, how the percentage of those components in, this, in the system will um, be detrimental to your catalyst. And then moisture needs to be dried slow um, before the decomposition steps. You don't want to flash all that moisture into your catalyst bed powder and or your gold trap system or moisture removal system. And then physicality. Can that sample be contained in that boat? So you just kind of look at the samples, do an overview, and then move forward from there. Another con point of concern is the uh, homogeneity of the samples. Um, is there any pre-treatment that might be needed so you have a uniform consistency? If you don't have uniform consistency, then uh, your samples can be all over the place when you report your numbers and your RSDs will be high, and it just won't won't be good analysis. Um, so soils and some plant material, maybe something like a simple coffee grinder might work to get them in uniform consistency. Um, and then also if the sample is combustible or explosive. Um, so if you're not sure, you really need to start um, small weights and see what happens. Remember that oxygen enhances the material's ability to combust. So explosive conditions can exist are unsure, I usually recommend 20 milligrams or less to start that method development of that sample. So for volatiles, um, typically you're looking at, you know, uh, PAHs. And again, I recommend a mass of 80 milligrams or less to start. And probably don't go above that um, because then you can cause stress points within the system. If you get too much of an explosion um, when it goes past its auto ignition. Um, so yeah, they're reactive. So you just got to be caref careful at, at, at this point. Uh, diametaceous earth, I load the boats with diametaceous earth. Um, it has been shown to limit the loss of mercury for um, volatiles. Um, and then you can also take and mix that sample with a non-volatile solvent. Um, so you dilute it maybe uh, one to one, and then that will also help secure the mercury within that sample boat from being off-gassed during the wait times. Then if you're unsure about it, any, any 
anything, I would recommend running the sample right away. And then you can run that sample at timed intervals to see if there is a loss of mercury um, before you go ahead and run those sample types and long wait times on the auto sampler. So there's things you can do to mitigate um, your inconsistent results that are reported. Low concentrations, you know, you can increase the mass if you need to within the um, conditions of the of the system. But you've got to remember that if it's explosive, you probably really need to watch that and stay at 20 milligrams or less if, when you're doing method development. Also, um, we offer multiple injections, but with that, you need to use a strict GL, GLP. Don't bias your results. Um, remember, this is a mass based system, so all the mercury is loaded onto the gold trap uh, post combustion, and then um, so it goes through the dry and combustion phases. And then after the last sample is loaded, so if you do three, two, three, four, we don't limit the amount of. Um, of injections that you do, um, but I wouldn't recommend going past two or three or four at most, because then at the end, all of the mercury is eluded, and then that peak is measured, and then it's divided by the total mass of all the injections on the sample. So if there's small contaminations in the boat and so forth on your hands or however you were loading those samples, you can see how it can bias to the samples you know, um, for a higher result than what should be. So you just need to use uh, caution um, when you're uh, using multiple injections, but it is a nice tool to use. High concentrations, they're mainly handled with our normal um, operating procedure. 100 milligrams of a 10 ppm equals 100 nanograms of mercury, and that's typically a calibration point. You can go up to 1,500 if you need to. So um, if your sample's at 10 ppm or less, um, it's going to fall within the dynamic range of the system. Uh, but if you use small weights, remember, you need to have a nice balance. Otherwise, you can have analytical, analytical error during weighing. And then also, small weights, you may be introducing a non a sample that's not um, homogeneous, so that can also cause concerns. And then if you wanted to um, dilute the sample, um, solid samples, are, are difficult to dilute because you need a blank material that's acceptable. So if you say you're running coal and you wanted to run uh, dilute the sample, you might use a um, carbon material that's free of mercury. But if your concentration is really, really high on the sample, you might be diluting like one gram into a kilogram or something like that, uh, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and then trying to make that sample homogeneous would be just a nightmare. So last resort, digest the sample, because we can easily run aqueous solutions with a max volume of five mils on the sample. Um, and then also, there's lots of samples that may be difficult to contain in the boat. Um, you know, you're looking at hair, feathers, glass wool, you know, anything like that. Um, in the food industry and the environmental industry, there's a myriad of samples that are analyzed for mercury, especially nowadays when um, it's a hot topic with the United Nations Environment Program and everybody is tracking mercury, where it's coming from, uh, where it's being deposited and deposited deposited and so forth. Um, so in order to handle all these types of samples, you can use something as simple as aluminum foil. So you can wrap that sample in aluminum foil. You know, you um, take and make it maybe two by two and put your sample in there after you tar it, you tear it and wrap it up and then run that in the boat. Um, but you just want to do a um, um, blank subtract if there's any mercury in that uh, media that you're using to contain uh, the sample. Anything that's like sticky um, cosmetics and, and those types of items, you need to be careful not to get those on the flange of the boat because that can contaminate the, the boat rack and can give a false positive to, say, the next time you use that rack for samples for another sample that actually may be a non-detect. Um, so from 30,000 feet, what's the big view of 
of getting started with method development. You gotta characterize your samples, try to determine the amount of moisture and adjust your dry time um, for the amount of moisture. Um, if the sample weights, um, if you're unsure, um, if they're high or low, you know, HG concentration of volatility, so you need to look at all of that. Um, estimate the sample mass needed for mid-range concentration. Sometimes that's kind of hard to do, um, but you might be able to get close based on history of those type of samples that you're running. Um, evaluate the response, determine your precision, precision and then adjust uh, decompos decomposition values if necessary. So dry time, catalyst temperature, uh, um, decomp temperature, all those can be adjusted to bring that precision in for that sample. And then finally, you need to determine accuracy of your method uh, using M SRM. If there's anything uh, applicable to the type of material that you're using, I suggest if you're like using plant material, maybe peach leaves, there's a lot of SRMs out there that'll be close to your matrices, which should give you a good indicator if that, um, method is working for that sample type. So first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you have clean boats and there's some general starting conditions that are in the system. So the catalyst might be at 600, decomp might be at 800 degrees, the um, gold trap might be set at 600. And those are these are the items that you will adjust to dial in your method. So basically you wanna uh, evaluate the RSD on three samples and then start adjusting those temperatures for the combustion and or catalyst if uh, things don't go your way. Now you have to follow GLP, uh, wear gloves while um, handling the boats and the samples and so contamination is avoided. And what we have to remember is this is an amalgamation, it's all at so everything that's in that system will be collected on the gold trap. So if you have contamination on you, you get it on the boats, um, in your environment and so forth, you're going to see that when the number's reported. Um, intermediate standards, I use a, a stock uh, liquid standard, 1000 ppm, and I make uh, 10 ppm 1.101 and all the way down to a 1 ppb, and I like large volumes. Uh, so one mil of the stock for that, one mil of the 100 for the 10 and so forth. So serial dilutions down to the 1 ppb, and I like to keep my uh, acid concentration as close to uh, 1% as possible when I get down um, um, to these intermediate standards because I want to limit the amount of um, acid that's in the system, in the boats, and be invented into the catalyst bed as well. But large volumes of standard will give you um, a more precise um, intermediate standard. So then what you want to do is these intermediate standards, you use those for the calibrations. Um, you can also calibrate with solid material if you want to, SRMs, it just doesn't matter. But I like the liquid standards because it's easy. Um, and I can adjust uh, the weight or the volumes of the intermediate to meet the mass requirements. So I typically will run my calibration from a blank up to a 50 nanogram. Um, usually 20 to 30 is your linear range and then I drop the blank into the high calibration range as well so here's an example of the responses you would expect and how I vary the weights of each intermediate to hit the nanograms I'm going after so for example if I want to hit 50 nanograms it's uh, 100 microliters or 500 microliters of the um, 0.1 ppm solution, and it's going to be measured in the high cell. The system will automatically drop the responses into the most appropriate cell um, that it can determine the concentration for. So getting started with method development, on the UI, here you have your main controls, you know, your drying, your, your catalyst, your time at 
at at drying, the decomposition, and so forth. Um, and you can set it up for a global method. Um, and then the decomposition time, typically about 180 seconds um, at whatever temperature. That's the minimum um, I use is 180 seconds. Uh, you also have the catalyst temp, lamp off, amalgamator temp. And then here you can get to the calibration where you can see the calibration uh, response and everything for the samples that you ran. On uh, the sequence page, this is where you enter in the samples. Um, this is um, has a lot of flexible features. You can cut, paste, uh, copy, auto renumber, and fill down and so forth. And you can click on this little button here and you can uh, control to the left or the right by just using your enter key. Over on this part, if you um, right click, you can start at any sample and you simply start adding trays and you can do five trays but if you need more trays so this is 70 samples at five 14 positions per tray you just simply click the plus button and you can add more trays and you can keep going so once uh, you get to say three or four and some racks have come off you can add more and you can add samples um, while it's on the fly the system doesn't care um, so there's a lot of nice features here now i'd mentioned that um, under the main UI for parameters, it's global settings. But once you get in here to the sequence page, you can actually change these for your sample type. So once you have, um, you know your methodology and what it takes to dry the sample, combust the sample, you can change all those parameters for each individual sample right in here. With the exception of uh, combustion AA VHC, um, we control the minimum dry time at 60 seconds at 150 degrees C. But in non VHC mode, all these can be adjusted. So it's some really nice features. So, for example, if you're running a sample, 10 samples that have high moisture and your drying time is, say, 180 seconds at 200, then you have 10 fly ash samples that are low moisture. Well, you really don't need to dry them, so you can hit uh, 200 uh, C at 10 seconds and then move right into the combustion sites. So you're going to save like three minutes of an analysis time right there. And then also um, going with uh, the preload, that's for multiple injections if you have low concentrations and you really want to see something. So under the, um, the type of sample, that's where you just enter preload load and then you can put the ID in here and then at the end of the last one below that it'll actually desorb the gold trap gold trap and that's where it'll take your analysis and um, you know, sum it up and base it all on the weight but remember this is all additive so you have to use caution and the strict strictest GLP when you're using the preload so you don't have any bias high um, the uh, favorites bar is is has a lot of neat features on it too. You can move through the UI by just clicking on a lot of these buttons. And we have a new sleep tool, so it it actually looks and monitors the temperature. And when the temperature of the catalyst uh, gets to the set point that you set, um, the gas will turn off, and then the system just shuts itself down uh, with its uh, injector closed. So you preserve the catalyst bed for the next time you run. Um, I also recommend using um, an external chemical dryer. I introduced this a few years back, a couple years ago, for uh, liquid samples, aqueous samples, up to uh, 500 or 600 uh, microliters. So it handles the moisture well, but also it has other benefits. It will remove some of the organic um, uh, vapor phase um, set um, constituents of the sample that may be coming through the system. Um, so it actually will help keep your cells clean and pristine. So your analytical cells, your 10 inch mirrored cell and your short cell will stay a lot cleaner. Um, so I do recommend the chemical dryer for almost anything. I run it on my system all the time. Uh, simply just uh, sieve it down to uh, uh, 850 uh, um, micrometers, and that's what's added into the chemical dryer. Anything that passes the sieve, you just discard. 
so when you want to get started then after you have your calibration all prepared and loaded, uh, typically what I'll do is I'll run three samples um, to get the system uh, up and running. And um, I'll use 100 mils, mil, milligrams of flour, 100 microliters of DI water, and then an empty position. Uh, and I run them through uh, sample, uh, run sample by itself. And then I have the sequence ready to go after that. And then I'll just um, start to start the system. If you're running uh, volatiles, um, I recommend diametaceous earth. Uh, again, it's been uh, shown that it will help preserve the mer mercury. But again, you'll have to run samples in uh, at different periods to see if there's any issues with that. Uh, another thing I do too is um, before I start, I always go to um, a system check. Uh, I check hardware positions. Uh, just a quick overview of the system, make sure I don't need any maintenance on the auto sampler or the injector or any of that. And this can be done um, on the sample conveyor control. And you can just move different positions, make sure your elevator is hitting the right spot um, between uh, uh, where it's supposed to be on the rack when it's lifting boats up and so forth. Just kind of some basic things you'd want to do before you hit go. So the low range calibration typically um, up to 20 or 30 is linear, but like I mentioned earlier, I run, uh, I like to put the 50 in there, so I run quadratic. So here's an example of the calibration right here, and over here I have some of the responses, um, um, the weights that I'm using, and then my calculated response. You can see the system is, is uh, has a nice return. So for example, the 50 here is coming in at 49.997. Uh, the one is 1.08. On the bottom end, you're you're a little bit um, higher in air down there, but that's given for almost any system. So it does show the nice return of uh, calculated value versus what you actually put in there. Same thing on the high range. Now this is an example of 50 nanograms up to 1000. And here you can look at the calculated values. So they're also very nice. And I pop the blank in here as well. So it'll be blank. And then this will be a 50, 100, 200, 400, 600, 800, and 1,000 nanograms in this calibration. So detection limits. Um, so what do they mean? So uh, CVAA, typical detection limit is maybe 1 to 5 PPT nanograms per liter. Uh, AF, you might be looking at less than 0.1. AF with cold might be 0 0.05. So in decomposition, we're mass-based, so we look at nanograms. Um, so typically, a system may be, depending on your method, maybe 0 0.001 or less in nanograms. So how does that work for reporting method detection limits? So you just simply take your uh, detection limit um, and divide it by the mass. So for example, if we have a detection limit of uh, 0, 002 nanograms and I use 0.2 grams a sample, it uh, calculates out to uh, 0 0.01 ppb nanograms per gram. So well, this system is designed for uh, US EPA 7473 and the two ASTM methods, uh, 6722. 7623. Um, I don't recommend it for a trace level in, in water, but you can do water down to low concentrations. But where the system really, really shines, it's superior in detection limits um, for um, to liquid digest. So for example, let's take and say our nominal detection limit on the system is 0 0.001. It's actually less than that, but let's say 0 0.001. And if I ran a 0.2 gram sample, I'm looking at 0 0.005 nanograms per gram or PPB, or um, PPB, correct. And if I ran a 5 gram sample, 0.5 gram sample, it'd be 0 0.002. For an equivalent or a comparison, those two detection limits right there, if I had an aqueous digest, it would have to be 0 0.05 nanograms per liter and 0 0.02 nanograms per liter associated with each one of those based on a 5 gram sample and 50 mils digestion, which is a typical um, liquid digest in either a block digester or a microwave digester or something like that. So as you can see, that would be very hard to hit those detection limits. Even with uh, cold vapor atomic fluorescence um, in, in gold mode, you're not going to see 
0 0.05 or 0 0.02 um, nanograms uh, consistently as an instrument detection limit. And then that's detection limit, so then you have to multiply up for a um, standard method detection limit. So the um, applicable methods are 7473, so that's solids and solutions. 6722 is for coal and combustion res residues, and 76.23 is a standard method for um, crude oils. So all of the methods, are, they typically all have the same thing. So you're going to need sample boats, uh, uh, mercury vapor for by uh, thermal decomposition, carrier gas, catalyst-based, um, so oxidation of that sample, and uh, amalgamation or gold trap for collection of mercury, and a minimum of two-cell detection scheme. So 7473, validation, solids and solutions. So here I have an analytical run over here, coal fly ash. I have a, a oil standard that I prepared gravimetrically. And then I run two empty positions because it was a high concentration. Uh, we're looking in the high cell at 120,000 units over here. Um, and carryover is pretty much non-existent, but it's a nice thing to have anyway. And then I run uh, seven samples. Um, a spike, and then my oil standard at the end. So here's the conditions, uh, 150 on the dry for 30 seconds, catalyst at 750 for 30. Uh, the wait time, that's the time it takes to flush from the catalyst to the gold trap. Could be less, but I typically use 30. And my um, decomp temperature, 180 seconds, again, three, three minutes at 800 gas flow. Here's your integration, your um, gold trap heat is at 700 C for 30 seconds. So the values come out are very nice. So here we have the SRM, which is um, a residual um, from coal fly ash. So that's part of 7473. Uh, survey says values at 1034, 103%. Even though it's outside of their plus or minus, I mean 3%, that is really, really tight. So that's a nice value. And 1619 is uh, certified at 3.46 uh, plus or minus 0. Um, 0.74 ppb nanograms per gram, and uh, we achieved 3.94 um, plus or minus 0. 0.18, well within the realm of that certification. So here, one run, I validated um, US EPA 7473. Now, when we move over to 6722, I, some of you probably see where I'm going with this. So coal fly ash and combustion residues um, is part of that one. So here we've just validated uh, 6722 with the recovery of the coal fly ash in this run right here with the oils. Now we move on to the ASTM method for oil, crude oil. I've also validated that. So here we have residual fuel, um, fuel oil at um, uh, 3.46 plus minus 0.47. So one run, I have validated three different methods with one run and one setting. So this is where I'm going to circle back and say you can run most sample types under one setting in the same condition. So this is really, really, really um, a nice feature on this type of system. So let's get into uh, liquid. So aqueous for uh, 7473 because it simply states uh, solids and solutions and they don't define the solution so in this SWA 46 which is a solid waste manual uh, 7473 so that's uh, typically for wastewater treatment plants uh, surface water and, and so forth anything that you're sending back into the environment has has to follow under this type of methodology so liquids, can we do liquids? Yes. So I ran a study of and varied the volumes of uh, tap water um, from 100 up to 1 milliliter and ran 42 samples. So over like five hours of time running the samples. Here's one, 
baseline at 100 uh, microliters, and here's the baseline at 42. Nice baseline, no intrusion of water vapor, nothing disrupting the baseline whatsoever. Here is the one mil sample. Here's um, zoomed in on it. It's basically nothing in it because it's tap water. But here's the baseline here on sample one and baseline 42. So no intrusion of water vapor disruption disruption of the analytical results whatsoever. Um, so the system parameters for this were uh, drying at 200 for 210 seconds, uh, low temp on the catalyst, and I went to a high temp on the combustion and amalgamation. Um, so basically it was like about eight minutes. And I'm using the uh, external dryer, the magnesium perchlorate, because you almost have to use that. And I mentioned earlier that um, it's, a, it's a nice add-on and I use it all the time. And when I get into maintenance, I'll, I'll give you an example why I use this. Uh, also, when you're developing any method, um, it's nice to know if the parameters are causing any issues from high to low. So I did a carryover study um, through this methodology on the aqueous or the liquid samples, and I left an empty position after each standard to look for carryover. Um, basically, what it turned out to be is the carryover was relatively insignificant in the big picture. For 200 nanograms in the most sensitive cell, I had approximately 800 microabsorbance units. When I calculate that out based on the calibration curve for this method, it came out to be approximately 2 PP, 0.2 ppb of uh, carryover contamination. But this is nice to have because then you can take this value here and the response from the most sensitive cell, you can put that into the... Um, uh, clean cycle for the system. So if the system hits a value of 200 nanograms or higher that would be reported in the sensitive cell, it would go into an automatic clean cycle. So to do a, um, a combustion cycle and a gold trap cycle to remove any residual contamination that may be uh, left over from that previous uh, high sample. So this is a nice thing, nice thing to do on any method. So you can really truly dial in that system. So everything that you report is true and accurate. Um, I also uh, did a um, bias test on delivery modes and something that you should do as well. Uh, so I made a 0 0.05 nanogram um, standard and used it with nickel boats, with diametaceous earth, uh, with L-cysteine, and then also um, uh, quartz boats. And then I ran an empty, an empty nickel boat um, seven as my control. So basically, the way it turned out, um, there's not a lot of difference between the three modes of operation with the 0 0.05 nanogram. The quartz was the cleanest, and it did have the lowest percent RSD, uh, with the exception of my control, which was the empty uh, nickel boats. But um, at 0 0.05 nanograms, there's not a lot of difference between any of these modes uh, for delivering the sample into um, the combustion chamber. Uh, results from the liquids, I ran a 1 ppb, um, 30 sample, so it was quite a long run, um, and then it ended up with a um, average of 0.87 ppb and uh, plus or minus 0 0.081, and the um, percent RSD was 9.2, which is not too bad for um, the system and, and the conditions. I had a couple of blips, so that's maybe what um, made it pop up a little bit higher, but unsure of what happened in that situation. And then I ran the uh, MDL study according to uh, uh, 40 CFR um, part uh, 136 appendix B, um, which I believe is being outdated, but anyway, my MDL came up to 0.1 ppb for this methodology. It could be probably a little bit less um, under maybe tweaking the conditions out a little bit as well. The takeaway from um, aqueous uh, samples with the US EPA 7473, um, using the 
combustion system for waters, you know, wastewater, surface waters. Um, it was really relatively easy. Preparation of the system for analysis, um, pretty much routine. Maintenance, uh, the chemical dryer wasn't a big issue, uh, nor was it time consuming. Uh, typical range would be 0.5 to uh, uh, if the sample is uh, half a mil, um, your range would be 0.1 ppb up to 2. If you reduce it, remember it's mass base. So if you reduce the sample down to 100 microliters or 0.1 mil, then your range is going to pop up to 0.5 up to uh, 10 pp, uh, pp, ppm without dilution, uh, which is a nice high value. Um, most of your reduction systems, um, it's hard to get dial in for a 10 ppm unless you use higher gas flows and low samples. Um, getting back to the volatile hydrocarbon or the VHC mode, um, we had a laboratory in the Netherlands, uh, Amos Laboratories. Uh, they um, were involved in a, a NAFTA study and ran two samples and nailed it. Really, really good results. Their Z-score was minus uh, 0.14, minus 0.20. Um, the concentration was 27.953. Standard deviation uh, from the sample set um, was 7.52, and they reported 26.9. Here were 28.053 and 26.5. So very nice values. Um, for the report on that, and they're certified for NAFTA with the system um, using the VHC mode. A little bit about maintenance. So on the favorites bar, there's a maintenance tab, and when you open that up, um, everything is timed. So it counts how many uses you have. Um, it also has step-by-step -step instructions, how to perform basic maintenance in detail. Um, so it's some nice features here as well. Um, but the system is, really, really easy for the maintenance. I can exchange the catalyst in about a minute. Um, you can look at your optics in about 10 seconds. Um, and then the system is stable over hundreds of injections. Uh, uh, response will start to decrease when your catalyst may start to um, fail and your gold trap, but it's two minutes to change that as well. So basically for the catalyst, there's a captive um, thumb screw. The injector will um, uh, swing to the side, a couple of um, capped uh, thumb screws here, and then your catalyst come out. Will come out to get you your cells. You just flip the lid up, and there's your cells exposed for inspection prior to running. Um, and then the catalyst um, is greater than 500 samples. So all the data that I presented here, um, the validation data, it was 354 injections when I started that run um, on the cat tube, catalyst tube, and the gold trap was 1,056, and then Affion had 629 uh, samples on it. So really, really, really good um, uh, return on investment for consumables. Um, so if you need to change the gold trap and or the Nafion, uh, this um, tray will slide forward and then you have access here. You pop out this module, here's your gold trap right here, a thumb screw, you pop it out, put the new one in, and then here's your Nafion right here. So just remove this outer cover, um, set your Nafion in its new cradle, put the cover back on and you're ready to go. Cell cleaning, now I wanted to speak a um, little bit about cell cleaning. So when I use my external dryer, to be honest, I have removed any organic gases and vapors and water vapors that may slip through the system, um, or your organic vapors are coming through regardless, but I trap them in that uh, external dryer. So if they're not being trapped there, they can deposit on the cells or somewhere downstream. Honestly, I haven't cleaned my cells in three years. I'm not saying you should do that, but uh, with that external dryer, it's a nice add-on tool. It just helps keep uh, the system in pristine operating condition. So when you want to clean the cells, you um, IPA, cotton swabs, you want to uh, have a disposable beaker, wear gloves, um, purity wipes, and, and lab disposable wipes to help you clean. So when you disassemble them, I recommend keeping everything uh, orientated the same. So left side, left side, right side, right side of the windows and caps, 
front cell and back cell have those all orientated the exact same way. So you put them back in the same way. So if there was a reason why you cleaned the cells, maybe a baseline that was out of control or something, uh, you want to make sure you put them back in the exact same way so you can uh, review the system and ensure that the cleaning actually did work. And you want to wear um, gloves when you do when you do that. So I just wash the inside with uh, alcohol and then dry the inside with a clean cotton swab. And then I flush with carrier gas to remove any particulates or fuzzies that may came up, may have come off that uh, cotton. And I can use the gas stream from the back of the instrument, just drop the PS, PSI down to about five PSI. Uh, same thing for the cell window. So what I wanna do is I wanna have the cells clean. So when I clean the windows, I have a place for them to be um, placed on so they can keep them clean. So I'm not putting them down on the on the paper towel or whatever I'm using. So you have a place um, to put them in and then you assemble them back up. So how does a Hydro 2C improve your productivity? Well, analysis time for dry samples are less than five minutes. Typically we can run in about four minutes and 20 seconds and even less than that if we really wanna push it. Wet samples about seven and a half minutes. Um, aqueous samples about uh, 8.5. Um, dry stages longer, 3.5 minutes. You have an MDL that is around a one 0.1 ppb uh, auto sampler capacity 70 samples but remember you have virtual um, 60 samples can be ran in about five hours now if you're doing a reduction system at 60 samples they're about the same time when you uh, factor in your your digestion steps uh, eliminate the weighing because you have to weigh samples for either one so we don't don't even need to count that and then uh, once you get fast, uh, more than 60 samples, the reduction um, is faster um, if you exclude the digestion uh, time and labor and you have multiple blocks to digest a whole lot of samples um, to get them into a uh, aqueous liquid that all your organics and everything is digested. So benefits, um, matrix independent, uh, you can use one calibration for most samples, which I've shown when I um, validated um, the three different methods, US EPA 7473 and two ASTM methods, 6722 and 7623. Um, so standard conditions and run multiple sample types without operator error. Um, and again, I showed the validation of those re um, methods. And the catalyst greater than 600 injections for um, Cold analysis, I've gotten as high as seven, 800 injections without any issues um, on uh, samples. Also, it's uh, analysis without matrix issues. One calibration fits all. Any type of sample, as long as you can get it in the boat and get it into the system, you can measure it. So here's some example of some percent recoveries on liver and blood, uh, dogfish, marine. We're looking at oyster tissues, sediments. Here we have soils and then coal at 100. 0.6% recovery, so nice values. So in summary, uh, the Hydro-2 um, is applicable for direct combustion. Um, it's superior detection limits for solids and semi-solids, and even the aqueous detection limit is, detection limit is quite nice. Um, they're really easy to maintain, um, and uh, I think it's fun. It makes uh, analysis fun and uh, worry-free. So with that, we will open up the floor for questions.